stress in a child's life kind of raises your cortisol levels chronically and that can result in chronic disease so there's a strong connection between chronic stress as a child and chronic disease that occurs as as an adult hi everyone drew Broad here host of the broken brain podcast today's episode we have dr achina stein here to talk about her new book what if it's not depression. Sometimes people are told that what they have is depression. And yes, depression exists. It's out there. Some people legitimately have depression. Other individuals, their body and their brain is on fire. So they can have depression-like symptoms, but it might not be depression. And to talk to us about it is Dr. Achina Stein. She's a psychiatrist, doctor of osteopathic medicine, functional medicine. She's been in practice for over 25 years. She's here to tell us her story of how her son, who was suicidal, inspired her journey to help him get better and ultimately herself through functional and integrative medicine. It's a fascinating conversation. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep into the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, mindfulness, functional medicine, mindset, and more. I'm your host, Drew Proid, and each week, my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and most importantly, live more. This week's guest is Dr. Achina Stein. Dr. Stein is an osteopathic physician who has been in practice as a board-certified psychiatrist for more than 25 years. Her story is super fascinating. Propelled by her son's mental health crisis in 2010, she found functional medicine, which resolved his health problems as well as her own, and has since been practicing functional medicine. Dr. Stein is certified by the American Board of Integrative and Holistic Medicine and is a certified practitioner of the Institute of Functional Medicine. She is a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and was awarded the Explanatory Psychiatric Award by NAMI Rhode Island in 2008. She is presently in private practice in Rhode Island, and she recently launched her online health coaching program, Healthy Self Bootcamp, to assist people from a distance to reach their health goals health goals, super important in COVID, and also is the author of the up and coming book, What If It's Not Depression. Dr. Stein, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to have you here. And I'd love to start with origin story. You know, when I read your book and I had a chance to meet you over email, Your story reminded me of the story of so many doctors who come on this podcast. Their interest in holistic health and functional medicine started with their own or a close family member's personal health crisis. So before we get to your son, tell me a little bit about your own health over the years prior to finding functional medicine. Oh, wow. Where do I start? (laughs) So... I, um, I had a pretty rough childhood, so my health, uh, when there's stress in the family uh, from having a, a disabled mother in many ways and a, a father who wasn't really the best father, we'll just be kind there in, in saying that, um, but just having a lot of stress growing up as a child, um, I had a lot of um, allergies and eczema and asthma um, as a child. Um, but then as I got older, I actually had a health crisis in 2003, where a culmination of things happened where I had a, I had just delivered my third daughter, had a Epstein-Barr virus, which made me feel like I was hit by a train, which then triggered a Hashimoto's thyroiditis crisis roller coaster um, that got me to become very depressed and um, was put on, you know, thyroid medication. But I also it was the first time in my life where I needed to be a, put on temporary disability for a couple of weeks and um, was put on an antidepressant at that time. And it's, uh, it's gotten better ever since, ever since I found functional medicine and I got my son all because his issues began in uh, 2010, but I didn't really address my issues until after 
I got him settled because we, you know, we, as moms, we always put our kids first, you know, and then I, uh, you know, used the functional medicine approach to handle my issues and a lot of things significantly improved. I feel 20 years younger and, um, and people are surprised uh, that I am the age that I am because of some of the things that I do. Um, I'm 50, I'll be 57 this year. And um, I play ultimate Frisbee with 20 to 30 year olds. So, and so people are always shocked to hear something like that, but I am in the best shape I've ever been in, in my life, mentally, physically, and spiritually. So, and I have, you know, you're, I'm telling, you're the first person for me to tell you this, but I've actually been off antidepressants for a year. And yeah, so I didn't want to mention that until I actually said, you know, been off of it for a year, but it's actually a year anniversary. It will be actually a year on November 16th. So yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, definitely um, been a journey for me um, in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, thank goodness for medication. You know, you as a practicing psychiatrist for over 25 years, you write inside of your book, like, You've used medication a ton. Medication has helped save the lives of patients that you've been supporting, patients that might be suicidal, that might be potentially violent or are being violent, or people that are just in really bad shape. So medication can be stabilizing. And through your experiences with your son and ultimately you through functional medicine, you realize that there's more than just medications. There's a lot more there that people can do. And while we can have an access medications and they can be very helpful, there's things that we can do today to limit our need and use of them moving forward in the future. So I want to come back to your story of your son because uh, it was in your bio and you referenced it earlier. You went on a sabbatical and uh, took some time off and um, went on this journey with your family, which started off great. Take us from there. Where were you? And then what situation did you find your son in? Well, we were, um, we took the sabbatical. My husband's a professor uh, in engineering and uh, it was, you know, every seven years they have this opportunity to be on sabbatical. So we decided, and that was going to be in France. And so we decided to attach a trip to India for two months. And, uh, and then we would be in France for two months. And that was uh, the best thing that we have ever done for our family. And it was, we took the kids out of school and we homeschooled them all through India. And basically it was a historical playground of learning. Uh, and then we, when we were in France, uh, there was a day when um, we were just, doing some schoolwork and uh, the kids were wanted to go to this store that had some special D and D kinds of uh, Dungeons and Dragons. They were really into Dungeons and Dragons kinds of paraphernalia. And so um, the, the, the boys, I have two boys and and a daughter and uh, my daughter's the youngest and uh, they had a little bit of a tiff. And for some reason, um, you know, my, um, one of them just got very teary eyed. He was missing his friends, which is, you know, normal, you know, when, when you're away for so long and, um, and suddenly we were, we were staying in this two bedroom studio apartment and suddenly he was just gone. And I didn't like, there's no way he could have left the apartment. So I'm looking around for him and I just happened to look out the window and we were on a fifth floor and he was basically standing on the ledge outside that window and looking down. And, uh, and I just kind of freaked out and <laughs> commanded him to get in, the, get in back in the, into the apartment, which he did. And he just started crying. And, and you know, it was, it was pretty clear after talking to him that he was acutely depressed, but it was just so strange for, for a, a, a kid. I mean, you know, when you're an adolescent, he was, um, he was 14 at the time. And, you know, adolescence is, fraught with a lot of mood um, instability, you know, they're growing, they're going through puberty. And so it seemed to be just that, but for him to act in such a way was just completely, you know, out of, uh, out of the norm, obviously. So, um, and you know, some kids do make those kinds of decisions and it's just because of, um, of, um, you know, just relationships and stuff like that. So the the thing is, 
what wasn't really uh, um, what really struck me as being very problematic was the fact that he could no longer read. <laughs> I mean, right. You were noticing some changes in his ability to focus. He had brain fog. Right. Yeah. He actually couldn't even read. He had, he uh, was, and he had the kind of memory that was like a photographic memory. He could read, you know, anything very quickly. It was a very quick reader and he suddenly couldn't read. And so that's what made me know that something was completely different. And um, so once we got home, um, which was uh, just a few weeks later, um, I had him see a psychiatrist and, um, and, uh, uh, and she put him on medications. I had him see a therapist uh, and he was on three or four medications for depression, for attention, for sleep, for anxiety. And um, he got better. I mean, he was no longer in danger, but he just wasn't my kid anymore. And so, um, and, but it, the reading piece was like, what's going on here? I took him from many to many doctors <laughs> and nobody could figure out why he had that problem, why that suddenly that was the change. And so I, I happened to, at the same time, be, I was, you know, searching for other alternatives for my patients because I would get to a point with some of my patients and like get stuck, like, you know, I know there's something else going on here, but I don't know what that is. And I looked at Andrew Wiles' program out west, and but I didn't want to have to to leave to go there because I had three little kids. You know, it just was too busy. And so I happened to find um, uh, Ed Levitan's practice, and I asked him if I could. He was a medical doctor in uh, Massachusetts, a functional integrative doctor. Right. Yeah. And he, at that time, it was Visions Healthcare, and so I asked him to allow me to shadow him because I had heard that he did something different and I was really, really interested. And so after shadowing him for a while, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to bring my son here. <laughs> and long story short, he did his thing, you know, getting to the root cause of the problem and um, made, uh, you know, did some testing, made some changes and my son, you know, definitely responded to those treatments. And, and if, I could, if I could jump in, let's pause there for a second and sure. uh, unpack a little bit of that. What, you, you know, you were shadowing him. When you started shadowing him at his practice and, you know, you are aware, you were aware-ish of a lot of holistic <laughs> items, right? Being a doctor of osteopathic medicine, right. that's a little bit more holistic than, let's say, just traditional MD. There's an awareness of the different structural aspects of the body and how the body acts as a system. Um, but what were some of the key distinctions that you immediately got that you became aware of in that, in shadowing him and kind of learning about functional medicine that you weren't aware of or didn't have that connection about before? Well, it was, it was a completely different way of thinking about things instead of uh, getting a history to arrive at a diagnosis, it was really looking at what were the drivers of some of the symptoms as opposed to clustering the symptoms and getting a diagnosis to match a pill to the ill. Now, I mean, that being said, um, you know, I as a psychiatrist would always get a lot of history and look at the biology, the psychology, the social aspects. And I've always operated that way, but he was getting, looking for physiological ish, you know, physiological drivers and, um, and also how that interfaced with the psychology. Um, he focused more on the physiology, but then the interventions were dietary right up front, right up front. And it wasn't necessarily switching from uh, conventional medications to supplements, you know. So sometimes people look at complementary care as uh, a, it's the same approach, but instead of using, uh, you know, drugs, pharmaceutical drugs, they use supplements instead. Right. Instead of give, giving you Advil, we're just going to give you this uh, something that's equivalent, that's a supplement to mask the symptoms. And what you're saying is that that's not really root cause medicine. That's just... Right covering it up through an integrative approach. Exactly. Yeah. It's just modulating it with herbs as opposed to chemicals, so to speak, you know, synthetic chemicals. So, you know, with, with my son, it just changing the diet was huge. And, um, and you know, 
Go ahead. And if I could ask one thing about that, my, my pardon for the interruption, on the diet specifically, there it's at least from what I was reading inside the book, there was kind of a main cornerstone, which your son was, was celiac, right? He had, he had celiac. Now, now, connect that to us because I think there's a lot more awareness of you know, celiac disease, but how could have that central component of celiac be tied into some of the brain fog, reading issues, uh, and other challenges that your son was having? Well, I mean, celiac disease is an autoimmune process occurring at the gut level. And, but you don't have to have celiac disease to, to create gut issues. You can have non-celiac gluten sensitivity as well. So it's either an IgE or an IgG you know, type of reaction so, um, or antibodies. There's different ways that you can have a gut, you know, gut inflammation. And that's just one of those ways. And, and it's something that you have to actually test for. And, and he was tested for that. And what we found after doing some genetic testing is that I contributed a gene to, to his gene pool and my husband did too. And his mother and his aunt, uh, well, his mother doesn't think she has celiac, but his aunt definitely has celiac. So, and their sisters. So, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, I wouldn't be surprised if my mother-in-law actually tested herself, had herself tested, she would probably come up celiac disease. She just doesn't ever want to know because she never wants to remove gluten from her diet, but that's another story. But, uh, you know, I, um, I, you know, it's definitely something that you have to have an index of suspicion, uh, especially if you have irritable bowel um, symptoms, you know, if you have, I mean, and my son has had those symptoms since the age of two. Uh, he was severely constipated and had severe eczema from the age of two, but nobody ever thought to test him for that, including myself, because I just wasn't educated about it, you know. So when you, when you really put, you know, connect the dots, it makes all, it makes sense, but you have to have this index of suspicion to even um, to think about it. And unfortunately, most conventional doctors are not taught about nutrition in that way, in, in connecting, you know, how the gut can, you know, how you know, food is connected to the gut, how the brain is connected to the gut more. I mean, that's becoming more and more, that knowledge is becoming more and more available, but it's, it's, uh, it's really, you know, incredibly surprising how it's still so separated that, you know, conventional doctors just use medications and that's all they do and never look at nutrition, never look at physiology or function. Um, so, t take us back to your son, you know, Dr. Levitin, uh, you, you did the shadowing with him. He saw your son as a patient. He immediately, you know, found out that there's celiac, there's these gut issues, there's these other things that are there and brought in a new dietary approach, right? Removing gluten, getting in more uh, fiber, changing a lot of the foods that were around. How long before you started to notice uh, a shift for your son? Well, he was, at, we did some food sensitivity testing, the IgG food sensitivity testing, and we found him not only to be gluten, uh, you know, having celiacs, he also had dairy and even more sensitive to soy. So uh, what was interesting is that when we first started before the testing, we, he was immediately put on a gluten and dairy free diet. And what, what do you do when you do that? You you shift to soy, <laughs> right? Soy foods, corn, other, other types of grains. And, um, and he got better in many ways, but also worse because we started adding more and more soy. And so once we got the testing back um, and we pulled out the soy, then he got significantly better. And what cleared up immediately, I should, well, immediately within a month, I should say, was the constipation and the eczema. Uh, that in, was in a month. And my son was so thrilled about that. Uh, because it was it was so dramatic. Uh, he was just having regular bowel movements, and he never had them <laughs> since age of two. I mean, you know, the pediatricians wanted to put him on laxatives, and I constantly fought that because I just didn't want to have him do. We would just let him take his time, and he had you know eczema as bad as you know looking like a lizard. I mean, I would tell him that he was part dinosaur because he was so into you know into dinosaurs when he was four years old, <laughs> and. And because his hands were so, so, you know, raw and dry. Um, so that cleared up 
so fast. And that's where that was actually where my son bought in to, oh my gosh, this has changed. And it took a few more months for the depression to get better. Um, it took a little bit longer because of the anxiety uh, was, it was multifactorial. It wasn't just his gut. It was also the social issues and sure. you know, being, feeling socially awkward in school, you know, which is just normal for that age. Yeah. And if um, some a child or adult, if somebody's had anxiety long enough, then, then also our system becomes wired for that, right? Our, our system becomes wired. So we are also working against and creating new neural pathways to not default into those things. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. What, so, was that, what was that like for you? You know, you talked about for, for him, like watching this unfold right in front of your eyes. Like, what were you thinking? Oh, boy. I, I was just, you know, thinking how amazing this all is. It just it's a new way of approaching mental health. That was absolute. I mean, it, it took a good year for him to get, you know, I would say a good year to two years for him to get completely better and off of medications. But just to see it happen so quickly, uh, it was amazing. But I, I knew that just shadowing uh, Dr. Levitan, because that's what made me think, I have to bring my son here, <laughs> is because I would see some of these cases where people were so sick. And I mean, I shadowed him for a good six months. And, and uh, they were so sick. And then on the follow-up, they got so much better. And their histories were just horrendous. Going from doctor to doctor to doctor and getting nowhere and not knowing what to do. And people were really desperate. And then people were just getting better. And uh, I remember one kid who actually came in um, to the office on crutches. And three sessions later, and he had been on crutches for like months and months. And three, two to three sessions later, he was walking with no crutches. And uh, so it's just so when you see those kinds of things happen, it's like, I need to know more. <laughs> and once you see these things as a physician, you can't unsee it. You just can't, you can't go back to the old way of doing things. You just can't. So I actually had um, Ed hire me. <laughs> I left my job as a medical director for a, a local community mental health center and, you know, started working for Visions Healthcare because I just, there was just no way I could continue doing the, the kind of work that I was doing. Um, not that it wasn't valuable. I mean, it was a community mental health center for chronic, you know, chronic mental, uh, chronic and persistent mental health issues. But I just feel like, felt like I needed to know more. I actually even imagined myself learning functional medicine and going back to the community mental health center and and doing it that way but little did i know that there's all of these logistics <laughs> you know i'm one of those people that's very can become very idealistic about cert certain situations and you know all of these barriers are in place are to prevent that from happening but i hope that someday <laughs> you know we can bring that this type of medicine this approach to those that population of chronic and persistent mental health. Problems. Absolutely, because we're definitely in a mental health crisis and we have been for some time and we need other solutions that are there. Let's put the bow tie on just at least your part of the story there. So you saw this transformation in your son and that really was like, wow, he's getting better. What were some of the biggest um, bang for the buck for our listeners, for you personally, because everybody is different, this is your personal story for the health issues that you were going through after you got your son better. What were the biggest bang for the buck things that you did to begin your healing journey and completely turn around your health? Whoa, well, I think, um, you know, because my son's diet had changed, uh, we, I automatically put myself on a gluten and dairy free diet. And, uh, so from that point, um, you know, that slowly improved my symptoms of allergies and eczema, uh, which he probably inherited from me. Um, but it was um, repairing the gut lining that was really, really key. My, uh, my um, t I don't know if you're familiar with TPO antibodies to your mm -hmm. thyroid, uh, mm -hmm. thyroid peroxidase antibodies. That is the typical antibodies for Hashimoto's thyroid uh, or hypothyroidism. There's another type called thyroglobulin antibodies, but my TPO antibodies were in the 3000s and uh, quite high for a long, long time. Basically for the, the audience that's listening and correct me if I'm wrong, 
a sign that your body is under, it, your body feels like it's being attacked, right? Right. Your so thyroid specifically. Your thyroid, speci your thyroid specifically feels like it's being under attack. Right. Right. So repairing the gut lining was really key to bring those levels down. And when that happened, I was able to actually bring my thyroid medication down. I was at 175 micrograms daily, and I was able to bring it down to 100. I'm presently on 100. And that, this is a, because I'd been on thyroid medication for so many years, since 2003, there's no way I'm going to be able to come off of that, that medication. Um, I still try to bring it down lower and lower, but you know, I'm, I'm going to be stuck on some dosage, but the fact that I've been able to bring it down from 175 to 100, um, is, is I think a feat, <laughs> uh, and come off of an antidepressant and, and all of the allergy medications that I was taking. I was taking acetylene nasal spray. I was on two antihistamines. Um, I was on Singular, <laughs> which is Montelukast. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a whole host of uh, allergy medications that, because I was so inflamed that I needed to, you know, suppress all those symptoms. And, and I, so I don't take any of those medications. The only medicine I'm on now is the Synthroid and, or uh, Levothyroxine. So we've done a lot of episodes on gut health on this podcast, but I always think it's worth a refresher in the context of the interview because you never know who's listening. Could be new listeners, maybe people that missed that episode. So break down the idea. You know, so much of functional medicine is health, is health and disease starts in the gut. But help us understand why in the context of especially what you were dealing with, with depression and Hashimoto. So you talked about the gut lining. So break that down and give some analogies or some context to the audience to help them understand how is it that the gut lining, this thing that is so far away from both our thyroid and our brain, is right. actually related to those things so deeply? So yeah, the gut lining is one cell layer thick. It's called an enterocyte. And it is the interface between the outside of your body and the inside of your body. And it is uh, what, um, it, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of his name right now. But anyway, I, I remember someone describing it really well that if you had a donut, you know, if there was a donut, uh, would, would the whole be part of the donut? <laughs> you know, or would, be, would it be separate? So if you took, I and mean, you, it would, most people, you know, think of it as being a separate part of the donut. It's the whole, but if you, right, or another, donut, or another analogy that I've heard is that like, if you imagine a, a, a pipe, right. With a, a long hole in, hole in it, like tubing, right. Even though you put something in your mouth, that's still considered the outside world to your body all the way through your stomach. And then all exactly. the way to the, the rectum, that's the outside of the body. And what you're saying is, the, the gut lining is the first place that the outside world meets the inside world. Exactly. Exactly. So when we, when we have, when we eat food that your immune system is lining. So you have this, this one cell layer thick and then your immune system is under that. And then you have your circulatory system under that. And it, there's a mucus layer right on top of that cell to protect it. And so when you eat food, your immune system's always sticking up their heads through this mucus layer between the cells to, to sort of test the environment, see what's being done, you know, what, what's coming through and making sure that it's safe. Um, and then there's these gates between each cell and there's um, different molecules, zonulin being one of them that opens and closes these gates between the cells in order to let certain molecules in. And some molecules go through the cell through osmosis, but some go, go through between the cell. And so I, I use the analogy of an airport uh, in, in that when, a, when someone comes from another country to our country, you have to go through customs. And if you have, you know, if you, ha you have to have your passport and your luggage is looked at and made sure that everything's kosher and before you go through. And so there's this process of making sure that you're safe in the same way your gut lining, it has that same, that similar process and your immune system are basically the, the passport checkers and the, the luggage checkers, making sure that you're safe. 
and um, and that but sometimes what happens is that breaks down and sometimes if there's a breakdown so if your immune system breaks down for whatever reason and that reason could be because of inflammation usually that's the reason but the inflammation can be caused by you know inflammatory foods infections uh, chronic infections usually toxins uh, and stress you know a lot and uh, those things can cause a hormonal change particularly cortisol release in order to that that sort of set the alarms off and that combination of foods infections toxins and stress can overwhelm the body so much that it goes tilt and uh, you know so for my son for example i think the reason why he had this episode at the age of 14 was because he had this inflammation from a very very young age of of um two, maybe even younger, but two is what is in my head and uh, all the through the years and then puberty caused his body to go tilt. He, you know, so for me, I had all of these allergies and, and inflammatory uh, um, issues and probably what contributed that to that was when I was growing up, we had a, such a poor diet. <laughs> We eat macaroni and cheese like three days a week, you know, craft macaroni and cheese three days a week, you know, McDonald's. We had such high, a highly processed diet because of my mother's issues. And so I, you know, I came to a head after my third child, I had Epstein-Barr virus, and then I had the Hashimoto's flare. So it's, it's a culmination of things that then causes your body to go tilt. Right, like um, there's a glass of water and drip, 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 drip. All these drips are the different insults that happen to your body and then one day it just overflows. And right. you see this a lot, especially with you know, women who have had multiple preg pregnancy is such a taxing thing on the body. Yes, you exactly. lose so much nutrients. You know, you're literally 3D printing another human being. It takes so much nutrients, <laughs> so much energy, which is why there's so much, there's, especially in this day and age where there's not necessarily the culture of refeeding and really protecting women who have just given birth and having them go through a process to re really build everything back up, which is right. more sort of ancestral nutrition. Uh, you see so much postpartum and you see so yeah. much postpartum depression and other symptoms and issues that come up because the body is just really doesn't have a lot of building blocks to work with. Right. So the autoimmunity piece comes up when if the body is under attack from either so gluten and um, lipopolysaccharides and other pathogens, lipopolysaccharides is the, it's part of the cell layer of a pathogen. If that gets through customs, the gut, you know, the, through the gut lining, um, or Epstein-Barr virus is a part of Epstein-Barr virus that, um, that uh, the body um, tags as um, being similar. It's called molecular mimicry. So it looks similar to other tissues. So if there's a pathogen that gets through that gut layer, that gut lining, and it, and it triggers the immune system, it starts attacking that pathogen, but it also starts attacking other things that look like the path pathogen. So there's some research that shows that Epstein-Barr virus and Hashimoto's are connected. And I had the Epstein-Barr Epstein -Barr virus right before I had my thyroid storm. And I find that most of my patients that have Hashimoto's thyroiditis do have Epstein-Barr virus, but now they're finding that there's other pathogens that are, uh, that are connected to other autoimmune issues, like Prevotella is connected, that's a type of bacteria that's connected to rheumatoid arthritis. So we're learning more and more about how that occurs through molecular mimicry. And so what we wanna do is um, close those gates, what happens is what we call is increased gut permeability. Um, and that's basically the gates, you know, the customs needs to be manned with the, you know, the, the, the officers, right. And, and the, the doors need to be shut. The locks need to be put on the doors and, you know, there needs to be more security at that gut lining. And so there's this, uh, part of our treatment called repair, we want to repair that gut lining, we want to feed 
those enterocytes, those gut cells. We want to feed the immune system and we want to close those gates. And there's a protocol for that that we use. And I find whenever I have someone who comes to me, I actually start in that place to calm down the immune system as opposed to just removing foods. You know, it, it, you really want to shut down um, that process. And um, it's called the five R's of gut restoration, removing what's causing inflammation, foods, infections, toxins, stress, rep uh, re um, replacing what's missing, all that nutrient deficiency that you were talking about. Um, lot of, so many people are nutrient deficient um, and uh, it's probably because they're not eating those, the right foods. Um, re-inoculating the gut microbiome and then repairing. And so I tend to do it in that order, but sometimes you really need to bring the inflammation down. So I go right to the repair phase right away. Um, there's a great paper by Alessio Fasano. Um, he is a, a internationally known researcher on celiac disease. And he wrote a landmark paper in 2015 about how autoimmunity is connected to gluten and increased gut permeability. And that's an easy paper to search for and download. It's an easy read. It's, it's extremely informative. I tell everybody about that paper. Yeah. Uh, people really want to understand how immunity, uh, autoimmunity can occur and how to resolve it. Because I believe it's totally reversible. I've seen people's numbers change um, and, and um, totally change and resolve, you know, so. Um, I've seen lupus convert back to normal. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And my mother, my mother had a uh, severe rheumatoid arthritis, which um, is another autoimmune condition for those that are listening. Yeah, she, 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 I, you know, we talked earlier before we started this interview about how my mother, um, was uh, the force in me writing this book. I, you know, I, I didn't really put it together until just recently. I, I had uh, mentioned to you that the day I um, decided to write the book was a year ago today. And, um, and today is the 30th anniversary of her of her passing. And um, I, you know, realized that I actually wrote this book for a per, you know, for the person that was like her, she had um, very, uh, she had a significant head trauma when I was four years old. And um, as a result, she started to hear voices and she was in an asylum for, for six months. And ever since then, uh, she was just not the same. Um, she was given a diagnosis totally inappropriately in retrospect of schizophrenia when most likely she had head trauma and she had a traumatic brain injury because she got hit by a car. Yes. Right? <laughs> like, she, like that would really, you know, mess things up. But at I the know. time, as you say, it was, it was the sixties. Doctors really didn't know the traumatic brain injury wasn't on their sort of radar. And right. so she was treated in the classic sort of this person's gone crazy rather right. than this person's brain is hurting and on fire. Right, absolutely. And so she started hearing voices and she was discharged on Haldol. And that's what she stayed on. No, it was never changed. Nothing ever changed. I, Cause I remember giving it to her. <laughs> I remember giving her the medication, twice, five milligrams twice a day. And she still was hearing voices, still had uh, severe problems with insomnia, became very, very depressed. And she had uh, severe rheumatoid arthritis to the point where she had gold injections put into her uh, joints. So she was in, in tremendous pain. And as a result, I, I mean, I, I mean, she was alive, but I, I lost my mother and, um, well, and the, it was a huge. The, the, the other thing that you say inside of the book is that there was a period of time, almost similar to your story, but differently. She went back to India and, Back in India, her diet changed, her environment changed, and you were there witnessing this, and she got completely better. She got, right. I, I won't say completely, because obviously you were there, I wasn't, but it sounds like in your right. story in the book, she got significantly better. And then, take us from there, you know, what, what ended up happening that the symptoms end up coming back exactly as they were? Yeah, it, it got the, she got significantly better because she was eating real food. <laughs> real food. 
she was eating real food. I mean, the color in her face, she had no pain. And, um, and also in India, there's heavily using infl- anti-inflammatory spices right. and other things. You know, food truly is medicine there with the Ayurvedic tradition. I don't know if that's the case exactly now uh, with India having one of the fastest growing rates of diabetes, pre-diabetes, right. you know, insulin resistance, but it was at one time. And so she was having food as medicine. Uh, right. And then what happened from there? Well, when we got home, um, back to the standard American crappy diet, <laughs> and all of all of her symptoms came raging back, absolutely raging back. Yeah, you had told her, you said inside the book, that maybe you should stay in India because you, <laughs> you seem like you're getting better. And it's, it looked like your mom was feeling like it was not India, but it was other things or medications or treatments that were there. Right. But she ended up coming back and... It's right. such a really a tough situation. You you share that you really saw and witnessed the decline of your your mother in front of you, and it was one of the hardest things you ever went through. Yeah, it was it was really hard because I'm the oldest of four, and I ended up basically being parentified and raising my three siblings. And I mean, I remember at the age of eleven, I was doing the grocery shopping and and cleaning the house and changing my brother's diapers. And, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty hard. It was, I mean, I missed out on a lot and, um, but you know, I, I did whatever I could to have some normal semblance of life. I, I remember, um, you know, just wanting to have such a normal life that I, I did, I cut the lawn, I did all the laundry, I made dinner, I made sure we all sat, you know, at, around a table <laughs> because I it just wanted to be like everybody else. And, um, and, but I ended up missing out on a lot of things, you know, when your friends have Girl Scouts and, um, and you can't be in Girl Scouts because you have to be home, you know, there's lots of things you end up missing out on and just not having my mother participating in things you know moms went to PTO meetings and right. and you know it's just not she just wasn't able to and but I know that in her heart you know, she wanted to she wanted to be able to participate she just couldn't she was just in so much pain and uh, had so much fatigue and uh, and I just I think my heart really goes out to moms um, you know, that have children of that age because because I know when mom is sick, the kids, you know, the kids suffer because I, I mean, I basically experienced that. And so uh, I, you know, in retrospect, I thought I wrote this book, you know, for, for my son and for children, but in, you know, but it really was for people like my mom, you know, Mm. if she, her life would have been completely different if someone who knew functional medicine was able to take care of her. Um, and, and she probably wouldn't have been, you know, you know, know, having the life, she probably wouldn't have had the life that she had, unfortunately. And she, cause she just got progressively worse and worse and worse to the point where she, um, basically was on a ventilator during my wedding. I got married in 1990 and, um, you know, she couldn't come to my wedding and, uh, she had been on a ventilator for six months, and then three three months later, she had passed on, which is today. So, right, we're recording this interview on a very auspicious day. It's her 29th passing anniversary, and you know, yeah. you open up the book. 30th, <laughs> yeah. sorry, last 30th. year was the 29th when you yeah. decided to write the book. Today is yeah. the 30th, yeah. and uh, you know, in your in your opening of the book in the dedication page, you call your mom, you know, your guardian angel, and I really think that the beauty of it. And the work that you're doing is that, you know, people are trying to live their, their lives. They're trying to parent and be a good mom or a father, or a husband, wife, whatever. They're, they're trying to show up strong at work and, and be a productive citizen. And they didn't go to medical school. They didn't study necessarily nutrition. And this is why it's so important that podcasts like this, like this interview with you, and functional medicine like yourself, functional medicine doctors like yourself are putting out books and educating people because we've gotten so far removed from the natural order of things that these issues are just completely devastating the lives of people. And one of the main reasons that we have this truly unfortunate mental health epidemic here in, in the United States and growing across the world. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I, 
I am so grateful that you do these interviews because we absolutely have to tell the world as many times as we can. And I think it's working. So many more people know about functional medicine. It's becoming a household world word, sorry, household word or phrase, I should say. Um, and so I, I truly appreciate that you are doing these interviews and, and, you know, being a spokesperson for functional medicine. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go back to the book to just touch on a couple more items sure. here in the interview. So you talk about the big picture and really lay the land in, term, in terms of like how your thinking changed, weaved in and out with also your story. You share the story of your mom, you share the story of your son, and then ultimately you share your story as well. Once people get past the story and they get the ways of thinking, um, talk about some of the assessments that are inside of the book, right? Like the, the um, quizzes that are there that people can kind of walk through to help them figure out, maybe get a little bit closer to uh, uh, getting healthy? Yeah, I, I think it's very important to really nail down your history. Uh, there's so many clues in your history. So I do a timeline um, of from birth, and sometimes if, if soon after birth um, someone has issues, I wanna know more about the mom's, gut, you know, mom's health even before birth. So, and I, I lay out all of the history in terms of what's happened to a person. And I focus on times where they've had infections, uh, times when they've had stress um, and their diet um, and also their habits of uh, sleeping and exercise. Um, it's important to get that down. And so many times people don't even remember uh, some things that have happened to them and it occurs to them down the line. And it's, it's, I have this way, I don't you know, people say, I like to dig, <laughs> I have this way of, and so, and what happened right before that? And what happened right before that? <laughs> it's like, there's something here that I miss. That's like, we're not talking about something happened here. And it's like, and so bingo, it comes up. It's like, that's, that's where it happened. That's your perfect storm. So it's, it's helpful to know, what a, per, a person's perfect storm of it's of two or three things three or four things that come together that create that tipping of the balance of, of of their of a person's immune system that you really want to hone in on and then sort of reverse engineer what might have uh, created those those uh, drivers you know, and and how they came together so um so that's one, that's a major piece that I do with people. But prior to that, I do have people do um, a, a test called the BERT test to, to see how uh, a person's digesting. I, um, there's a candida questionnaire because candida happens to be one of those um, pathogens that conventional doctors dismiss completely and it's a major, major cause of symptoms. Um, so candida questionnaires in there. Um, there is um, the ACE score, which is uh, looking for um, sort of a screening for childhood trauma. It's adverse childhood events. Uh, and that gives me, a, it, it's a nice jump off point uh, in terms of asking those questions when people are feeling more comfortable. But it's a nice way to screen and uh, upfront to know what I'm uh, dealing with. That, that gives me an indicator about how stress in a child's life kind of raises your cortisol levels chronically and that can result in chronic disease so there's a strong connection between chronic stress as a child and chronic disease that occurs as as an adult um, so and then there's the multiple symptom questionnaire that is from the um, institute for functional medicine where uh, it is a tallying of a number of symptoms on uh, your rate then from zero to four. And it's, it's looking at that total score of um, toxicity, so to speak. So the symptoms are basically symptoms that uh, result in inflammation by, sim by systems. And, but it's looking at a, sort of like a bird's eye view of what's happening in the whole body in a snapshot. And I use that form uh, as part of my intake, but then I use it for every appointment. And I, the goal is to bring that score 
um, to below 10. But it's a great way to see just how sick someone is, how bad sort of the damage is in their body, and, and it gives you an idea of, uh, of, you know, sort of where to look, so to speak. So for example, if somebody has a score of 150 to 200, um, that, you know, we're probably looking at uh, inflammation that's been there for so long um, that it's causing a cascade of damage over and over and over again. Now, the example that I use is it's like if you had a tub overflowing from of water and you were on the second floor, this tub was on the second floor, and if it was, you know, overflowing, uh, you might, you know, depending on how long it was overflowing, you might have some damage in, in the immediate area. But if you don't turn off that tub and let out that drain and you keep it running and running and running and running, it's going to go up the walls. It's going to damage the cabinets. <laughs> it's going to damage more and more. And then eventually there's repercussions of that damage, even if you turned off the tap and let out the drain of that tub and got right. an H back in. And you might suck up all the water, but the damage has been done. And so it's almost like a secondary damage. So the MSQ score, uh, the multiple symptom questionnaire score, um, uh, really helps to sort of gauge maybe how much damage has been going on and how, you know, how, how much of this is uh, sort of a repercussion of things, you know, and, um, or, you know, just cascade of things is probably right. a better word. Yeah. No, there's, some, there's some great uh, questionnaires, great resources inside of there, all with the, the goal of helping to do some sense of self-education, self-assessment, but then you can take that and then you can go find, you know, depending on how the severity of the symptoms that somebody's going through, you can go and find the right practitioner to help you, you know, with the process. Um, Tell me a little bit about, we mentioned your coaching and also, are you still seeing patients in this day and age? Oh yeah. I see patients every single day. In fact, I'm seeing one at three o'clock. <laughs> so, yeah, and, no, I, I definitely see patients face to face and, um, you know, every week I see, you know, a variety of patients. Um, but, um, I, I, uh, you know, in the intro, you talked about my online health coaching program. I've had to, I've had a, jump back and forth with that. There's been some issues with that COVID being part of it, but, um, but we're going to probably have that back online in a couple in the next couple of months too. So. Yeah. yeah and for our, for our listeners who want to reach out to you or follow you on social media, what's the best way to be in touch with you? Probably the best way would be to go to my website, which is functional mind. That's the name of my practice. Uh, but the website URL, I can't speak today, is www.fxnmind.com. F as in Frank, X as in X-ray, N as in Nancy, mind.com. And uh, the Healthy Self Boot Camp is uh, the URL for um, the online health coaching program. Um, and uh, you can also find me at www.achinasteindo.com. Fantastic. And we'll have all the links to those in the show notes, as well as the link to the book that's out there. Love the title. What if it's not depression, your guide to finding answers and solutions. There's a lot of answers and solutions inside of here. Doctor, thank you so much for sharing your story, for reaching out and for us, you know, getting connected. You're doing important work and we need a lot more practitioners like you if we're going to address um, this, this epidemic that we're all going through. So thank you so much for providing the information that you do. Oh, thank you. And blessings to you. I really appreciate you and keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs>